Good evening. Hi. Um, on behalf of the uh, Rariel Hess Scholar in Residence Planning Committee, which is very long and hard to put this thing together, um, I'd like to welcome you to this, uh, the 11th uh, Rariel Hess Scholar in Residence Memorial Lecture. I don't know if that's quite as a very long. We have a lot of rubrics. Looks good on this heavy paper. <laughs> um, this lecture is uh, basically under the auspices of the president of the college, who, alas, this year is not able to be with us on the state. And so uh, her welcome will be offered by uh, the very uh, dazzling. California uh, with family and she sends her regrets. Uh, she's been a very strong supporter of the Wolf Institute and this program in particular uh, and, and I can see why. I've been here for two years and I am already impressed with the level of activity, uh, the amount of energy and passion that the Institute brings to the campus to enliven and enrich the community and the level of scholars that are brought in uh, you know, 11 times in the uh, you know, that really just transform the campus and remind us that we're in a rich learning environment. Uh, so, uh, Bob, can you just stand for a second? And members of the planning committee, I just want to acknowledge you all and thank you. <laughs> this is a group led ably by Bob who continue to push on uh, and, and move forward, never settling for just uh, the status quo and challenging our students. Uh, so I want to thank Bob and uh, welcome Rob. Uh, and uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, Richard. Um, I see why he stood out here. can't see anything. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm on double business now. Uh, the first thing that I have to say is that since the president has passed away in the beginning of 1992, and this program was founded by his friends and relatives, um, it's been a sort of a steady recurring feature of faculty life here. And one of the most interesting parts of it is that Francis Hess, his widow, uh, followed and, how shall I say, guided the progress of this program pretty attentively. Um, and this year, well, the last year, she came to the uh, Thomas Frank, uh, the dinner for Thomas Frank, and uh, she had been ill, quite ill for a while, but she managed to get there, and a couple of weeks later she passed away. And, uh, we always had her on our minds when we were doing this because she would always ask questions that were a little surprising, enormously intelligent questions, uh, and also very pointed questions. Like, you know, who's the caterer and have you chosen the entree and all that kind of thing? She was always <laughs> very attentive about the food, and I'm glad that she wasn't here this year because there, there were some problems about the food. Uh, we hope that won't happen again next year. Um, but we're going to talk about her a little more later at the, at the dinner, but she, um, very generous uh, in every way with her time, her attention, and also managed to garner an enormous amount of support uh, for this program. And it has freed us to follow the rubric that we followed right at the beginning, which was to find the best person that we could to address the concerns that we were interested 
Uh, a few years ago, we had uh, Francis Sterling. Um, I'm sorry? Eleanor. Eleanor Sterling, I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, I think you we had Eleanor Sterling, who is the head of sustainability studies at the Museum of Natural History, and also in some way also at Columbia. Uh, there seems to be a secret connection um, under the web. Um, she was terrific, but the thing that was the most interesting about it was that, you know, we, if you look down the list of scholars and residents, they've been from many fields. And so every year, once we've chosen a scholar and resident, we assemble a planning committee, which I'm after was sort of SWAT team. Different people with different subjects. So in the course of chairing this committee, I have gotten to know an awful lot of things. Uh, to learn an enormous amount from my colleagues, which is one of the beauties of my job, is that I do have a lot from my colleagues. Uh, and I was astonished to find out in how many departments there existed these little secret coves of environmentalists, you know, who were, who were uh, digging up the dirt in backyards in South Brooklyn to test them for lead and various other things. Just enormously impassioned intellectuals, enormously committed, and it's not, I don't mean that they were all in the backyard, but entirely under my radar anyway. Um, so I was very enlightened by this, and I was also very thrilled to find out that there was this passion. And this, it was it's both intellectual and moral, a genuine passion. <coughs> and uh, when the chance to uh, invite Rob Dixon came. Uh, is, is Mustafa here? Mm -hmm. I think it was you who suggested it. Wasn't it? Mobina. Okay, Mobina Hashmi. Where are you, Mobina? Yeah. Mobina. <coughs> uh, it turns out that the under environmentalist underground is all over the place, and uh, they all know each other. Um, so. We wrote uh, to Rob Nixon, it took me about a week to write the letter because I was so afraid that he wouldn't say yes. And I heard so many great things about him and then after uh, we had gotten to read some of his work and it is stunning and surprising <coughs> and uh, I think for a lot of people, maybe a lot of the students in particular, it would be life changing. Um, I'll just tell you a couple of the sort of facts that we usually recite at these things that really belong more on a headstone than anywhere else. But he's, he's written at least four books, including uh, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor, which is the background of the lecture. Uh, he got his PhD at Columbia. He comes from South Africa originally. Has a PhD at Columbia and has taught for about 15 years at the University of Wisconsin uh, until a couple of years ago it suffered an environmental disaster of its own in the form of the governor of Wisconsin. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the most satisfying thing about him was his career as a presidential candidate. Uh, such a dunce. Uh, and since uh, two years ago, he um, he has been at Princeton, which is not likely to have the same kind of um, His his biography, which is uh, to anybody else who is pursuing an academic career for any man, his biography is more or less heartbreaking. Uh, there isn't anything he hasn't done or won, and and he's still. Uh, so I recommend you to read it in detail. Um, um, we've, he's been here now for three days. He's ha held many audiences of students, wrapped. He does, but he doesn't treat them as an audience. He engages with them in a conversation in a way that is astonishingly nimble 
nimble, incredibly well well informed, and incredibly generous and um, full of goodwill. Uh, he's everything he ought to be and more. It's my pleasure. associate with the word environmentalism. 
uh, um, martyrdom, uh, assassination. Uh, I think that the figure in Brazil is something like 485 in the last uh, four years. Uh, if you go to Nigeria, go to Cambodia, you, around the world, particularly in that tropical belt where some of these resource wars are being fought out most viciously. Um, it's, it's really uh, people are putting their life on the line. And to call them environmentalists is to limit them. But the environmental justice struggle is entwined with struggles for, for native rights, for land rights. In this case, um, opposing a mega dam that was uh, the, the indigenous people hadn't even been informed was being built and was going to cause uh, displacement for thousands of people. So I wanted to sort of contrast today two uh, ways of looking at environmental time, and, and they're both large scale. The first is what has become one of the most pervasive memes of today, which is the, the idea of the Anthropocene. And this was an idea that was floated by an atmospheric chemi chemist and an ecologist. In other words, it came out of the sciences uh, in 2000. And the idea was that our impact as a species on all the life systems, uh, the water system, the the air, the, the, the nitrogen cycle, uh, the ice sheets and, and glaciers, uh, the, the, the oceans, um, that our impact has been so great that we have now effectively jolted the planet into a new geologic uh, uh, age, which is called the Anthropocene. In other words, the Holocene, which lasted about 11,500 years, <coughs> and it was a relatively stable envelope of time, has been destabilized by the weight of our actions as a species. And the scientists are saying this is historically, uh, geologically unprecedented, uh, that if you go 2.5 billion years ago, you have the cyanobacteria that oxygenated the planet, but there's never been a sentient species that has had such an impact on the planet, okay? So we're talking about the impact of uh, uh, emissions and, and, the, and the carbon disturbance of the carbon cycle, what's called the cryosphere, the ice, uh, ice system, uh, the rising of the oceans, um, and the, the, uh, the impact of, of weather systems, so the weirding of the weather, uh, mega dams, uh, since we had the capacity to fix nitrogen in the 20th century since we discovered that, uh, nitrogen has allowed for industrial agriculture, for the feeding of more and more people, but it has also created huge algae blooms and uh, lots of uh, dead zones in the ocean from, from agricultural runoff. Uh, habitat loss is a big part of this um, in relation particularly to industrial farming, and species loss, the biodiversity loss uh, at the I think they're estimating something like 80 times the background rate, the expected rate, okay? Uh, and another, another aspect of this is the rise of megacities uh, around the world, uh, the, the hyper-urbanization. Uh, now, from a perspective of the geologists, what they're looking at is what the fossil record will look like uh, a, a thousand years, two thousand, ten thousand years from now. And they're discovering that there are new forms, like what they call plastic, plastic glomerates, which are incredibly compacted plastics that have a, a, a rock-like uh, durability that will be part of our legacy. And, uh, of course, uh, unprecedented isotopes uh, it, that, that will be in the, uh, in the geological record. So this story, um, is, is perhaps the most dramatically summarized by the Berkeley biologist uh, Anthony Bonofsky when he said, uh, we are the meteorites, okay, that's Earth on the right, that's humanity on the left. Okay, so we're a kind of thinking hulk of rock with fields, okay, and uh, are colliding with, with the Earth. And this uh, idea of the Anthropocene has, has uh, Prosted many debates about when did this exactly begin? Did it begin with uh, early human settlement, maybe 7,000, 8,000 years ago? Did it begin with industrialization? Uh, did it begin with 
Colombian invasion of the Americas. Uh, and the most, um, the largest consensus is that it began in the mid 20th century with what's called the Great Acceleration. In other words, you had a global spread of these impacts scaled up to a point where they'll be legible in the fossil record. Okay. So we might ask, why should we be interested in the fossil record? Okay, that seems more like a geological specialty, specialty. Um, but the, there is an enormous amount of uh, intellectual energy and conversation around this idea of the Anthropocene. Uh, there have been huge um, exhibits in Munich, in Stockholm, Australia, all over the world. And wherever, coming from the humanities or the social sciences, wherever you're engaging with the sciences, very often what you come, come up against is this question of the Anthropocene. Uh, and so it's an imaginative idea uh, as well as a scientific idea. And I think it's, it's become a, an important bridgehead to the environmental humanities. So my, one of the points of my talk today is that if we look at the Great Acceleration, we look at all of these impacts in life systems, earth systems, the, the rise in, in automobile ownership, emissions, uh, electrification, urban population, migration, um, uh, um, uh, mining, scale of mining, uh, it, it, it starts moving up very, very rapidly in the 1950s. But my argument would be that we need to read the Great Acceleration in relation to what's been called the Great Divergence. Uh, and that for most of the period since the 1950s, certainly since the late 1970s, um, we have been, have, we've been, most societies have been experiencing a widening chasm between the uber-rich and the ultra-poor, a hollowing out of the middle. And so what you've had, even when you've had economic growth, is growth without uh, with, without equitable distribution. So in interacting with the sciences of, around the idea of the Anthropocene, one of the things that I have found myself and, and other like-minded people saying, well, what, how, how does inequality fit into this pattern? One human being may have a, a footprint that is up to their knees. Another human being, you know, nomadic Malians say, might have a footprint that's barely discernible in the sand. Okay? So to lump us together as a species, this, the species thinking needs to be disrupted or disturbed or brought into conversation with uh, divergences of impact, particularly in a, a, an era where, uh, um, as I say, distribution uh, is, um, is becoming uh, a, a, a huge issue. And inequality, as you know, is now part of the political conversation to a degree that it wasn't even even five years ago. So I want to focus uh, this this question of how we um, disturb the species story with the inequality story by looking at at mega uh, at mega cities, rise of mega cities. So so we have Manila and we have Delhi and we have Rio. And we have Rio again, uh, Nicosia in Cyprus, Delhi. Uh, and I wanted to pause on, on one of those mega cities and, and think, think about it in a little bit more depth, which is uh, Lagos, which is the biggest city in Africa. Nobody knows exactly the last estimate of population was 21 million. And the Lagos Lagoon is the site of, I think, a very uh, resonant and very important contest over what counts as environmentalism, what counts as green. And there is this uh, uh, new uh, peninsula uh, that is being created called Eco-Atlantic in the Lagos Lagoon, okay? And it's this green, futuristic city um, and it's got a, a, a seawall around it, and it um, supposedly the, the, the building uh, meets the standards of environmental, uh, uh, in, environmentally sound, sustainable buildings around the world. 
They sent the seawall off testing in Denmark and it would pass muster for the 100, 100, 100 year storms and, and sea surges. So it, it's been very, uh, eco obviously as in ecology, uh, it has been uh, a very, very, very heavily and packaged and marketed um, ideal of what uh, a sustainable city uh, can look like. It's a giant reclamation project from the Lagos uh, Lagoon. Now on the other side of the lagoon, we have Makoko. Uh, and this is a, a floating city, uh, uh, primarily of uh, immigrants to Nigeria, non-Nigerians. Okay? So these, these two communities are sharing the same lagoon, basically. Not really sharing it, but they're on the same lagoon. Okay? The one is an aquatic gated city that is supposedly uh, a global green uh, model of greenness. Uh, and the other is, is Makoko. And so what I'm suggesting is that the argument around uh, um, eco-Atlantic, that it's uh, sustainable, that it's built to withstand the rising oceans, etc., uh, is an argument that it's built against rising seas, but it's also a barricade against the advancing sea of poverty. Okay? And that is never part of the story, the official story that's told. It's an exclusive, there are helicopter pads, there are all these things. Uh, and so the it's an example where, where the language of greenness um, becomes a camouflage for social exclusion. Okay? Um, there's a uh, Nigerian architect called Kunle uh, Adeyemi and some colleagues, architectural colleagues, who have uh, undertaken a different kind of greening project uh, in Makoka, the same lagoon, uh, which involves uh, setting up a floating, uh, some floating schools, because none of the Makoka kids were going to school. Uh, and also there's a, a project to try to get solar panels. So the, the things that the, the, the uh, inhabitants of Makoko lack uh, are, are energy, education, uh, fuel, water, and so this is a much more modest and, and uh, but uh, different type of green project happening in the same lagoon, in the same space, in the same aquatic space. So I think when we, when we think about the mega cities as a component of the imminent fossil record, or the future fossil record, as a component of the Anthropocene. We need to hold these two sides of the lagoon together and say, how do we integrate that as a story? If we're talking about the human story, these are both part of uh, the, the same story. Um, and so that in linking the great acceleration to the great divide, um, we are uh, paying attention to zones of exclusion and zones of abandonment as part of uh, this Anthropocene moment. Uh, and so when we see statements like this, which are, are, are very common uh, by Anthropocene uh, scholars, it is difficult to overestimate the scale and speed of change in a single lifetime humanity has become a planetary scale geological force. We need to uh, just question this we, we the asteroid. Who is this we? Um, and just break that apart a little bit and think about histories of colonialism uh, and, and uh, histories of, of power and, and differential histories of, of income and impact as part of that. So Anthropocene scholars are obsessed with the legibility of the present from the perspective of the future. And so I would suggest that in addition to um, looking at the the, the, the fossils, uh, the, the, the rock strata, we need to also think about social strata, uh, and not only class clearly, but what's the relationship between social strata and uh, um, the sedimentary layers of, of rock. Um, so the second part of the talk, I, I wanted to shift focus to slow violence, uh, which also involves large expanses of time. Uh, 
<coughs> slow violence, as I see it, is really the, the violence of deferred effect. And that may sound contradictory. Uh, we're used to thinking of violence in terms of bullets, burning cars, exploding heads, uh, blood, uh, a graphic kind of uh, uh, scene. Okay. Slow violence is where you have something that's not normally regarded as violence and uh, that suffers from a drama deficit. Uh, so in other words, it's difficult to fit into our visual expectations of what violence looks like. Uh, and so Agent Orange would be a classic case of that. You have uh, the 55,000 casualties or if Vietnamese killed by America in, in the war in Vietnam over a 12 year period. That's kind of bookended in a certain way. That's a, a, a standard way of telling a story. But then you have intergenerational uh, deaths, premature deaths. You have uh, the, the, the uh, biomagnification of, of chemical effects through the food chain, through the cooking pot. Uh, those are not war casualties, okay? So I'm, uh, what I was trying to get at is the discounted casualties and the fact that some populations are, uh, are treated as disposable communities and some ecosystems are treated as disposable ecosystems. Uh, and so there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a discriminatory element to uh, the whole process of slow violence. Um, sort of, uh, Flint, Michigan would be a case, in a point, a recent case, where uh, something is, is fixable, doable in other communities, but in those communities, in poor communities, in communities of color, um, the, the, there is not an equal treatment of the citizen over the duration of a period when damage can be caused. So these are really like emergencies of the long term. And one of the examples I use, for instance, is, is landmines. Uh, there, you know, uh, I think something like one ninth of Cambodia is still not usable as arable land because of the density of the landmines that remain and haven't been cleared since the Vietnam War. Uh, and so Laos, Somalia, Angola, so many countries, uh, you have this uh, delayed violence after the war is officially over and officially forgotten. So in the speeded up kind of uh, news cycles that we live in, the speeded up presidential cycles, although they may seem eternal. <laughs> uh, but we, our attention span, uh, there's some competition of our attention span, and spectacle is such a, a, a component of that. And so what about, how, how do we find ways to tell these other stories and to bring into view uh, these other kinds of casualties that are typically discounted? And so I think, it, for instance, in the example of war, um, both in advance and in retrospect, the body count gets shrunk because you don't look at the environmental factors, typically. You just look at, at, at people killed in conventional uh, violent ways of violence. So we can take the example of the, the, the Gulf of Mexico, um, Deepwater Horizon. You have the, the catastrophic explosion, uh, uh, which is all over the news. And then you have the spraying of Corexit. Uh, and so the, uh, the orange areas there are where the oil uh, meets the Corexit. And Corexit is a substance that was banned in Europe for, for its toxicity. Uh, but there were these very dramatic spraying uh, runs. And that has also ended the food chain. And, and Anne McClintock, in, in some work she did on this, uh, argued that basically the, the, the attack was not on the oil itself, but on the, the visibility of the oil. Because what the corrector does is pulls it below the water, and so you have these plumes that continue to exist, but they're no longer visible. Uh, and you have the toxicity of the correct thrown in there. So that, that is the, the sort of the, the longer story, but it's not a very dramatic story. It's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to, uh, to sensationalize it. Uh, and this was one image that uh, somebody came up with, uh, obviously an, an allusion to one of the most uh, famous, um, Eddie Adams' uh, the famous photograph from the Vietnam War era of an execution. Uh, of a Vietnam prisoner, 
and the, the BP logo behind it, uh, the, the, the sun, sun of BP. Uh, and I, I don't know whether this was part of it, but you know, one of the communities that's most affected in the Gulf is the uh, Vietnamese American immigrant uh, shrimp fisher, fishermen. Uh, and those fishing communities uh, are, are, are profoundly affected by the mutation of the shrimp by um, the, the decline in sales in shrimp and so forth. Uh, but it's an attempt here to, to compress something elongated into, into a visible moment of, of violence. Um, uh, an area that I've, I've thought about a lot and, and written about from the Great Hill is the Niger Delta, where for uh, nearly uh, 40 years, there was the equivalent of an accident of Valdez spill every year, uh, just from leakages. Uh, and the the thing about this was you had an authoritarian government in Nigeria uh, that owned the uh, had its own national oil company together with Shell, and they together neither of them had any interest in um, controlling the oil spill. In other words, in, of applying uh, uh, environmental standards, and so uh, a lot of the pressure on Shell. Uh, they could say, well, we're just, we're just following Nigerian standards. And the Nigerians will say, well, Shell is in charge. So nobody really took responsibility. Uh, until uh, there was an activist called Ken Sarawira in the mid-90s, and uh, an organization uh, around him called uh, the Organization for the Survival of the Ogoni People. And his people had lived, uh, uh, along with many other tribes, uh, surviving off the Niger Delta which was very uh, rich mangrove area with uh, fish and, and, and fruit and bush meat and so forth. Uh, and so that source of, uh, of, of local uh, nutrition uh, was completely devastated by these spills. And he realized that nobody was paying attention to this localized struggle until he articulated it as ecocide and uh, got uh, Greenpeace and uh, um, Amnesty International and other international organizations who talk about uh, human rights, who talk about uh, e ecological rights. Uh, and the backlash against, and, and part of that was to use leverage in uh, the rich countries of the North to hold Shell to a single standard, to say what's happening at the moment is unacceptable because you have one set of operating standards in Europe, another set of operating standards in Africa and Latin America. If you're one company, you need one set of standards. Uh, and so that was, that was part of the leverage that, that people were using. Uh, in 1995, uh, the Nigerian government executed Ken Saruwiba and eight other activists on trumped up charges. And he became Africa's first or most prominent environmental martyr. Uh, and again, this was an image that tried to really pull together the component parts of, of, of complicity uh, and, and uh, execution and also slow death, the slow death, the drip from the pump. Uh, so tomorrow we're going to hear uh, something about Wangari Matai uh, and she's been a, a great inspiration to many people. She's a, a, a Green Belt Movement activist in, in Kenya and East Africa more broadly. Uh, and she, she uh, I just want to read this quote and then I'll talk a little bit more about her work. She said, during the rainy season, thousands of tops, tons of topsoil I eroded from Kenya's countryside by rivers and washed into the oceans and lakes. Additionally, soil is lost through wind erosion in areas where the land is devoid of vegetative cover. Losing topsoil should be considered analogous to losing territory to an invading enemy. And indeed, if any country were so threatened, it would mobilize all available resources, including a heavily armed military, to protect the priceless land. Unfortunately, the soil, the loss of soil through these elements has yet to be perceived with such urgency. Um, so what the Greenbelt movement uh, that, that uh, she headed did was to recognize that uh, with deforestation and the, and the loss of vegetation, um, there was massive erosion, uh, and women in particular uh, had to do more and more work to walk, walk, 
further to get water, to get firewood, to get fuel. And this had health consequences uh, for, for families. Uh, and so she started this movement of, uh, along with seven other women to try to uh, get people to plant trees. And so it became almost like a Gandhian movement with the sapling as, as the symbol, uh, a nonviolent movement. Uh, and eventually, uh, I think 100 million trees were planted, something like this. Uh, and she, she talked about how her grandmother had told her uh, when she was a little girl, uh, when collecting firewood, never to cut down the fig tree because the fig tree's roots held together the riverbank. Uh, they created anchorage for the riverbank. It, it, it had enormous shade and it kept the river cool. And she went back to that tree uh, when, uh, when she was an adult. And, it, and, and the, the fig trees along the river had been cut down and in fact the, the, the river had disappeared. Uh, so what she was trying to do was uh, to, to inculcate in rural women uh, uh, both some element of, uh, of, uh, of agency in relation to an authoritarian government that really didn't care about the plight of the land or the plight of rural women in particular. And also in the process to seed a kind of a civil rights movement, uh, a more broad, a broader movement for democracy. And so the tree planting became associated with the sort of planting of seeds of, of, of a democratic impulse against uh, authoritarianism. So uh, I want to move to uh, a question of uh, maybe a familiar image to some of you. Uh, this uh, president, uh, not of Brooklyn College, but of uh, 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 the Maldives. Okay, and he, what he did was just before the Copenhagen Climate Summit. Uh, his island nation, which is very small in the Indian Ocean and not really on anybody's map, hardly anybody's map, uh, is in the front line to be inundated. So within probably 40, 50 years, the entire Maldives nation will become uh, climate refugees. So he got his cabinet, this is his cabinet, uh, to put on scuba gear and to sign a declaration saying that it would be carbon neutral within 10 years. Uh, and we did a video of this as well as uh, um, uh, linking up with 350.org. Uh, so there's an element here of, of kind of a desperate humor. Uh, but perhaps the most important point is that the nations including the small island nations and the islands of the nations around the Sahel and Central Africa in, in Central Northern Africa are the nations that are most affected and they historically are the nations that have contributed very very little to um, uh, to CO2 emissions historically so it's a, it's, a, it's one of the things that, that came out of this was the uh, small island movement as a kind of a climate change block, uh, and a, a, a new uh, audibility uh, of environmental justice activists connecting around uh, nations that were particularly hard hit by climate change, uh, largely island and, and desert or semi-desert nations. Uh, and it's, it's we're familiar, even in the current electoral cycle, with the language, uh, with the xenophobic language of inundation, swamping, uh, drowning, uh, uh, um, uh, being submerged by uh, foreigners, usually people of uh, uh, darker brown, dark brown skins. We go back to the Great Gatsby, civilization's going to pieces. I've got a terrible pessimist about things. Have you read The Rise of the Colored Empires by this man, Goddard? The idea is if we don't look out for the white race, we'll, we'll be utterly submerged. Okay. So what comes to mind when I look at the Maldives is the reverse submergence uh, of these islands uh, uh, that are paying the price for the, uh, the uh, material advantages that have amassed to the rich CO2 emitting nations. Uh, just last year, Michael Fallon uh, said British towns are being swamped by immigrants and their inhabitants 
So this, this language of swamping um, uh, is, is a recurrent one. Uh, and so with, with Mohammed Nasheed, what I see is a kind of colonial, uh, anti-colonial carbon uh, insurrection uh, of kinds. And this is ironically, I've both ironic and desperately planted Maldives flags on the seashore. We, Seafloor. We normally think of flags as statements of pride or conquest, uh, assertion. Uh, this is uh, like a, a, a territorial displacement to the bottom of the ocean uh, and planting, planting the flag there. And when I was thinking about that flag, there, there was another <coughs> flag that had just appeared one uh, year earlier, uh, and this is a, a, a videogram of that. And this was a flag planted uh, by a Russian submarine on the seabed in the Arctic. And the leader of the expedition said the Arctic is Russian and claimed something like one million square kilometers. Okay. And I started thinking about these, these two flags together. The one, the flag of, of desperate submergence, and the other, the flag of colonial, uh, uh, a, a new wave of colonialism, uh, intent on, on, on grabbing uh, the, the mineral resources, the oil, the gas on the Arctic floor. So as the, as the Arctic was melting, more possibilities have become available, and this has increasingly uh, led to a kind of arms race around who owns the Arctic, and there are all these geological debates going on okay, uh, over, over who exactly uh, uh, owns it. And uh, the, the former Prime Minister of Tuvalu, another endangered island nation, said climate change is a form of slow terror terrorism inflicted upon us. Uh, and there is a sense of, of these, these two ends of the climate scale. And uh, this is very much integral to the, to the rise of the climate justice movement, to say that we need to act as a species, but we need to recognize within those actions uh, a differential history. Uh, and differential practices. Uh, and so, a very different demographic in, in Isaac Cordell's uh, politicians <coughs> discussing global warming. Uh, the combination of dissembling uh, a very limited demographic, to say the least, backs turned against the world up, uh, up to the next in it. Uh, and I, on this, on this sort of water issue, I, I really take to heart this quote uh, from Maggie Hamlin to Scallop. The, uh, the words are engraved on the, on the edge of the scallop. I hear those voices that will not be drowned. And that's uh, a quote from Benjamin Britten's uh, maritime opera, uh, Peter Grimes. And uh, hearing the voices of, the, of the, those who refuse to be drowned, whether they are immigrants, uh, Syrian immigrants, whether they are uh, imminent climate refugees. I think he's part of the role of witnessing both within any uh, uh, movement and in terms of artists. And I must say, it's something in my conversations with a Brooklyn College student of the past few days that I've been really, really impressed with is the number of students who are both activists and artists and are trying to find ways to integrate those skills um, because uh, we know that every, every social struggle, whether it's uh, a struggle for climate justice, whether it's um, a struggle for uh, the suffragette movement, the civil rights movement, anti-apartheid movement, uh, marriage equality, every struggle uh, had to change the storyline, had to change the dominant storyline. Uh, and changing the story is not enough, but without changing the story, uh, nothing changes. And, I, and I, really, I really was struck just listening to uh, the students, how many of them are active on different fronts and, and using both their artistic and their activist skills. Uh, so I wanted to close by thinking a little bit about activism in the air. And this is a, um, a stage marriage ceremony in Beijing. Uh, and, and, and what happened was a group of students in, in, in China, across different parts of China, started uh, mobilizing against the 
horrendous quality of, of Chinese air. Something like 1.2 million Chinese die prematurely as a result of uh, pollution. Uh, and so, but by some accounts, there were, there were 30,000 environmental protests in China last year. It's hard to know exactly what counts as an environmental protest. But the air has been a real, real wedge issue. Uh, one of the th reasons why I think the air is both uh, a slow violence issue and an immediate violence issue is that we breathe involuntarily between 17,000 and 30,000 times a day. Uh, and if that breath is difficult, we're in a perpetual state of pain self-consciousness, uh, whether you're asthmatic or whether the, the, you're living in Delhi or uh, some of the larger Chinese cities. Uh, the air quality is so typically bad that uh, what, what seems natural, what seems ordinary, is made extraordinary with every breath. Uh, so it's, it's both about carbon emissions and the, the climatic future of the planet, but it's also about the individual in the present uh, dealing with particulates. Uh, and so an enormous amount of activism has arisen in China around this, and, and it's particularly important, I think, because it demonstrates the degree to which um, air is... is is an area where it's harder to have elite enclaves to these zones of exclusion zones of abandonment. Now, um, Ulrich, Ulrich Beck, uh, the uh, <coughs> scholar of risk, once said that poverty is hierarchical, but smog is democratic. Uh, and that is partly true, that you cannot control the winds and, and everything. We, we do know also that uh, typically the worst air is zoned for, uh, for communities of color, poor communities, as far as is possible. But weather patterns change and, and uh, weather patterns are wrong. And what more and more people in China in particular are, are recognizing is that you can have growth, you can reach for the good life but if you're breathing atrocious air uh, with atrocious health consequences, what, uh, what is that worth? Uh, and, and so these uh, student protests, I think, are part of a larger uh, a movement uh, in China um, to, to really uh, to connect the, the muzzling of speech, the censorship, including uh, deceit around uh, uh, particulates in the air with the physical difficulty of breathing. And last year, uh, some of you may have read about the this, uh, film called uh, video that was called Under the Dome, a documentary called Under the Dome, which was seen by I think 150 million people in three days before the Chinese government took it down. I mean, it's enormous. Um, and it was exactly on, it was by a um, TV anchor, and she was talking largely about her daughter and, and air, and opening it out into, the, into a public discussion. And so it went, it went viral, and it has been called like the, the Chinese uh, Silent Spring. Uh, but it's a very, very, very powerful uh, film, and I, I would recommend it to you because it does get at these issues where you have a merging of immediate urgency and uh, the long term. Which brings us to water and air together, and uh, I Can't Breathe became a, a, a meme or a, or a, a, a rallying cry uh, for, for some obvious reasons, I think. Uh, Eric Garner was brutally killed by the police, by Chokol, uh, but he also uh, Grew up in Staten Island. He was asthmatic. Uh, there's a reason why uh, he was asthmatic in relation to the uh, industrial history of Staten Island. And so, one of the challenges, I mean, uh, Brendan Mock and a couple of other people have written about this, is how to stay focused on police brutality, on the 
the immediate violence, but also open it out into questions of structural violence, slow violence, the great chokehold in the sky, uh, which uh, is disproportionately suffered by uh, poor and, and, and communities of color. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I've noticed is how this, uh, this rallying cry, I Can't Breathe, has reverberated around the world, in different parts of the world. And a friend of mine was, was walking, did a, a, a long walk uh, from Cape Town Airport towards uh, Durban in South Africa and came across uh, this mural. And it's at a very interesting place. If we think back to that image of the Delhi airport, of the plane and the, and the squatter camp, Cape Town Airport is like that. It comes with a very glamorous uh, um, mountain, the ocean, uh, the airport, and then you have the squatter camps immediately there. And those, next to the squatter camps, you have the, the, the cooling towers and the, the um, uh, the emissions, and you also have this big highway. And so there's a physical sense in which the inhabitants of those squatter camps, and again, these are a, lot, a lot of those people are immigrants from other parts of Africa or other parts of the country. Um, physically, they're struggling to breathe, but they're also trapped in, in, in the segregated way from the elite uh, tourist economy. And so I've heard from other people in other parts of the world how this, how this, this phrase, I can breathe, really resonates because it, is, it can be both physiological and, uh, and, and metaphoric or allegorical, if you like, of political uh, frustration. Uh, and so I wanted to close with an image that really uh, surprised me. I mentioned earlier with uh, Ken Tarawiwa, the activist who was one of uh, nine who were executed in the Niger Delta uh, in 1995 for protesting shell uh, pollution policies, uh, pollution activities. And I was traveling in the west of Ireland, a historically very poor part of Ireland, uh, near the town of Rossport. And uh, I, I didn't realize there was a, at the time, there was a battle going on with Shell. Shell was drilling for uh, gas in this estuary. Uh, and they had done no in environmental uh, uh, tests on impacts. Uh, people hadn't been informed. The, the fishing community was absolutely traumatized by the effects of the gas now. And I came across this mural uh, in Gaelic uh, with the names of uh, this is we were and the names of the eight, the uh, Goni eight who were executed with him. And it's one of his poems uh, translated uh, into Gaelic. Uh, and they had renamed some of the streets in the village after the Agoni 8. And what they were doing was linking up with another estuary people who understood what it meant to be dependent on the water, on the quality of the fish and the environment, and were battling a common enemy. Uh, and it was something that was really quite uh, striking. Uh, um, the anthropologist Anna Singh talks about uh, traveling allegories, uh, the Wichika Mendes or Gary Matai or Nelson Mandela, how certain figures and certain stories will travel and, and have a half echo in unlikely places in different parts of the world. Uh, and, and this was one that really uh, had, had a very profound impact on me. Uh, so, in short, uh, <coughs> I think there's a real role for artists, uh, people in humanities and social sciences, those of us interested in questions of story, narrative, imagination, governance, uh, to put pressure on the idea of the Anthropocene and to say uh, it, it's great to have evolutionary psychologists and uh, biologists and geologists talking about the species narrative and what's changing at that level. But let's at least uh, introduce into that conversation uh, these, uh, the, these histories of disparity. Thank you. Thank you.
Columbia, where there's a literature student. Um, there's so much to address, in, and it's a very powerful presentation. I'm particularly taken by your discussion of air pollution, um, because I have been focused at times, not in recent years, on air pollution. And it is the most, for the very reasons that you say, I use slightly different language from a legal perspective, it's the most difficult thing to regulate because air, of course, re uh, uh, respects no boundaries at all. No, no. And I was involved in the New York Attorney General's efforts in the early 80s to try to prevent Midwestern high sulfur coal burning that EPA was allowing in the Midwest, would never dream of allowing in New York State or any of the New England states, and we argued with scientific models that there was, a, there was an interstate transport of those pollutants from the Midwest that was causing, causing acid rain in uh, the Adirondacks lakes. Absolutely. I can't tell you how frustrating it was to have the US EPA oppose our efforts and claim that the models weren't reliable, they used every technical argument, and it was the most frustrating thing to see the, the federal environmental agency yeah. opposing us instead of joining with us if they didn't like our models, tell us what were better models to measure this. So it gets very frustrating. On the other hand, there have been improvements. The air yes. quality in New York State is much better, and in most states Absolutely. is much better than it has ever was, uh, as it was as of the 70s and the 60s. You can swim in the Hudson River now, yeah. which you could not do 30 years yeah. ago. So um, so there are little victories on these small scales, absolutely. which may seem very small compared to, these, to the global issues where you're absolutely correct, you're a thousand percent correct. I, I don't know what the conclusion is about all of that, except that it does seem worthwhile to, to work on those small efforts, even if it does, you know, no, you know to yeah. defeat the, the bigger issues. Ab absolutely. I mean, you know, there are often, people often say that you, 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 you need to tackle an issue that's big enough to make a difference, but not so big that it, you, it overwhelms you. Right. And setting a trail of precedence also is tremendously important, uh, and, and being able to refer to what has been done elsewhere. We see this with uh, renewable energy and you know countries like Denmark and Portugal even not a particularly rich country you know that, that have, have got to a 30 40 percent renewable uh, and we see it with uh, leave it in the ground movement the, 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 the kind of groundswell of uh, changing the conversation and the one of the forms of slowness can be scientific proof Another, as you say, can be legal procedure. Um, but sometimes a combination of, of a, a vocal public and an increasingly informed public, uh, alternative media, which we could have in, uh, voluminously with the, with the internet now, um, and uh, scientific and legal experts working at their own pace. So it's all it's sometimes happening at different paces. Right. Uh, but as you say, uh, there are these, there are these victories. There are these, um, uh, even in parts of the of, of the global south, these these inspirational uh, precedents. Yeah. Yeah. The the p the postscript to the story that I mentioned to you is that the defeats in the federal courts that we suffered in the eighties led to a, a, a political and legislative change, so that the nineteen ninety amendments to the Clean Air Act dealt much better with interstate transfer and uh -huh. also international yeah. okay. transfer, uh, transport because we've had issues with Canada and the United States about the transport of air pollutants across uh -huh. national boundaries. Uh -huh. So there's some slow incremental yeah. changes, but compared to these bigger yeah. problems, it, it <coughs> seems small. Well, it's important. I was curious if you could talk more about the <coughs> Atlantic the Eco Atlantic in Nigeria. I'm curious to know um, who's backing that that initiative, that construction, and who are they targeted, or who is it targeted for? And then also, do you think it's a kind of a, a form of neo colonization, like going back in and, and having these elites sort of take over areas of these regions? I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, actually, no. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good question. I appreciate it. Uh, there is a, a 
the elite come in all, all hues, right. and there is a large Nigerian oil elite, okay, who are part of a global elite, kind of jetting elite. Um, and so there, there, there are, there's a sort of ease of travel among that class. There are these enclaves within nations all around the world, and so particularly in places like many African countries, you have the kind of uh, fully regulated mineral enclaves, and then a lot of uh, international people around that, and then you have these elite enclaves. I mean, the most expensive place in the world to get a hotel room is Luanda, Angola, uh, which is one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, but um, it's there are very there's very little infrastructure, very poor social services, so people pay through the nose just to get water, Mars bars, whatever that is they're, they're <laughs> living on. Uh, and so there's, a, there's an oil rig culture there of international oil people who are completely dissociated from the society at large. And some of those are native, and some of them are foreign. Um, and so I think uh, the, the cachet of being green can, uh, can also come with the, with the, with the cachet of being <coughs> cool and rich. Uh, we know that locally, we know that uh, internationally. Uh, so I think that's really the, the market. Like This, this puts, uh, puts Nigeria on the map as a kind of ultra-modern society in some ways. It's a display thing. Uh, uh, and also just people who want to uh, be segregated from the poor. Yeah. Actually, on the, the, the round table yesterday, we were talking a bit about that, or I was listening a lot to, to what students had to say in relation to, because um, there were many different forms of activism, like some people were working with uh, kindergarten gardeners in community projects, uh, other people were working with uh, um, taking urban kids out into the, into the land and work, work, working the land, through environmental justice issues, uh, say with Gowanus with uh, um, uh, um, asthma, some questions like that. There were Title IX activists, so it was quite a quite a widespread. But what really struck me was that uh, a number of them were using um, social media platforms and had enormous number of followers, and were saying, "Well, there was I always had this creative side to me, and now I've found a way of merging the creativity and the activism." So it wasn't even as if there was one or two causes. I mean, there, there's some causes like tuition that everybody cares about. But there are other causes that are seem to be like maybe disconnected. But the, what, I, what I felt in the room was the students uh, understanding the mindset of creativity and activism combined uh, and the way that they could circumvent to a large extent the corporate media uh, uh, through that. Yes. Yeah. Um, what's so ethically so violent? Um, is that connect, like how does that connect with slow food? Or with sort of that other sort of slow Yeah, the other slow 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 other slow slow slow. Yeah, yeah. It's slow good and bad. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we know that yeah, slow can be good, slow can be bad. Technology can be good, technology can be bad. Even trees are not, a, are, are not an innate good. We know that there's something called, sociologists talk about just green enough, where neighborhoods will get some greening, and if you get too much greening, then you get gentrified and, and the rent starts to be moved, okay? The trees can be evil. Well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's true about slow. I mean, so slow food is an attempt at, at community and at, uh, at least I think in its origin, uh, at uh, 
trying to uh, reorganize the way we socialize around food. Um, uh, whereas slow violence is uh, in relation to a culture of hyper-acceleration and attenuated attention spans. Uh, so I was trying to, I mean, in that sense, it's, it's, it's a different, it's a different take on I, I was just wondering if there's a time where, like, if, it's, if you slow down enough, you might be able to see the slow violence more clearly I mean, because you're yeah. sort of operating at a different Right, I mean, I think one of the, where I look for uh, encouragement uh, um, is, is, for instance, in the sustainable cities movement where you've got uh, levels of governance that aren't necessarily at a, at a federal or state level. And also the indigenous people's movements like Idle No More, uh, movements in the Amazon and elsewhere, uh, have been really, really active around uh, uh, trying to integrate or, or trying to defend a vision of time that is not turbo capitalist. You know, it's not just maximize the profit uh, and then think later or move on. Because, uh, and so without romanticizing people who, who live in these environments, uh, people have typically developed a set of relations with an environment and know what is necessary if you want to stay alive next year, you know. Uh, and so the, there are these different cosmologies of time, I think. And, and sometimes because, particularly if you've, all you've known is neoliberalism, it, it's hard to, to believe that there is another way of living in time. Uh, and so I see those as sort of cultural resources and the people like Leanne Simpson in, in, in Canada, the First Nations leader, who's really amazingly articulate <coughs> on, these, on these questions of, um, of, 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 of temporal identity as, as, as a resource, as, as an alternative, a source of resistance in some ways. The, uh, the slow food movement and the slow cities movement yeah. both uh, encourage in all kinds of ways a kind of mindfulness right. that makes that can make people much more aware to the kinds of degeneration, the kinds of subtle toxicities and the things that you talk yeah. about and on, on the right. slow violence, which are so easy to ignore if you're moving in six miles an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Dinner in your car as you drive. Right, right. Yeah, I think the mindfulness, uh, the mindfulness question is important in, in forms of attention, and I, I do see that with with um, with the new media platforms. I mean, not so new, just pretty old now. But uh, social media platforms uh, are often very, very good at uh, generating high volume in the instant, but the the business of sustaining that over say years or you know keeping that organized can be harder um, and, and I think that that's very much uh, a question of what's what's the kind of counterpoint between face-to-face -face organization and digital organization and, and how do, how do they how and where do they mesh it seems like they, they work against each other right I mean we, we can't pay attention to anything for longer than 15 seconds without checking but the tools of social media, yeah. communications technologies have also become essential to the And I understand a lot of what you're talking about, yeah. a lot of kinds of communications and connections that you're talking about. Yes. But there also seems to be... They're rewiring people. Uh, yeah, it's a race to the bottom of the brainstem. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And in ways that seem to... Uh, Certainly not not uh, be conducive to slow anything. Yeah. Slow yeah. or sustained anything. Yeah. Well, yeah. I I I think again, it's, it's a kind of a neutral form in itself, and it's how it's how it's wielded. And what you, what you do have is uh, I said I mean Black Lives Matter is maybe one of the most obvious recent examples. Uh, a channels of testimony that can uh, achieve sudden uh, visibility and impact that weren't possible even you know, five, 10 years ago and forced uh, sort of mainstream media, say uh, uh, CBS or New York Times, I mean, to pay attention. 
Um, but the question of, oh, how do you build a movement uh, of attentiveness uh, in a culture of inattentiveness thereafter? I think that's, that's, that transition is what often proves tricky uh, in, in, for the reasons that you, you suggest. Yeah. Thank, thank okay. you. Thank you.